Welcome back to Disturbed Reality. People are undeniably captivated by the concept of lost media for a multitude of reasons. Firstly, there is a certain allure surrounding the idea of something being lost or hidden from the public eye. It taps into our innate curiosity and the desire to uncover mysteries and discover hidden treasures. Lost Media presents a tantalizing challenge as it prompts individuals to embark on quests to unearth rare and elusive pieces of cultural history. Additionally, Lost Media often carries a sense of nostalgia and sentimentality. It harkens back to a bygone era, evoking memories and emotions associated with the past. The absence of these works creates a void in our collective cultural consciousness, leaving us with a longing to fill in the gaps and complete the narrative. People yearn to reconnect with lost moments from their childhood or past to explore the artistic creations of the past sparking a deep sense of nostalgia that fuels their fascination. Furthermore, Lost Media holds the potential for unique and undiscovered gems. It represents untapped creativity, unseen performances, and hidden masterpieces. The mere possibility of stumbling upon a lost film, song, or artistic work that is groundbreaking or revolutionary, drives people to scour the depths of archives, attics, and forgotten corners of the internet. The excitement of unearthing a rare piece of lost media, and being among the few who have experienced it firsthand, is an exhilarating prospect, to say the least. Lost media also fuels a sense of community and camaraderie among enthusiasts. It brings people together, creating a shared passion and a platform for collaboration. Communities dedicated to the search for lost media form online, where individuals exchange information, theories, and discoveries. The collective effort to track down and preserve these lost treasures fosters a sense of belonging and a shared purpose, strengthening the appeal and fascination surrounding the topic. Ultimately, people are fascinated with lost media because it embodies the intersection of mystery, nostalgia, discovery, and community. It represents a quest for hidden knowledge, a yearning for the past, and a desire to preserve and appreciate the artistic creations of generations gone by. The allure of lost media lies in its ability to transport us to another time, to unravel enigmas, and to rediscover the forgotten fragments of our cultural heritage. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, however. The topic of lost media can also lead one down a deep dark rabbit hole of pure evil and depravity. Lost Media, which quite frankly is a clickbait title here in the true crime or gore genre, as most of the media in discussion isn't lost at all, but more so suppressed from the public eye by authorities. Disturbing lost or suppressed media covers a variety of different cases, such as tragic accidents, animal attacks, serial killer footage, cannibalism, animal cruelty, and much, much more. In relation to gore and true crime lost media, the picture is hazy, as many have the tendency to either exaggerate the truth of certain incidents or even claim a video's existence based on their own imagination. Muddying the waters for those looking to get to the bottom of certain topics. A perfect example of this 
would be the infamous Funky Town Gore video. A disgusting video perpetrated by an organised criminal group in Mexico in which they completely decimate, destroy and brutalise their victim. The video itself is bad enough as it is, though in recent years people have claimed that a longer version of the video exists, with some claiming that it shows the victim being dragged across the bloody tiled floor by his eye sockets, whereas others claim that it shows the process of the victim's face being flayed. Of course these claims are complete and utter nonsense. It may be due to the fact that many are still seeking answers in regards to the reasoning and motives behind the Funky Town video, as well as who the victim actually was. Very often, when we see a tragic violent unsolved case, our minds will be left to fill in the blanks, leaving only our imagination to conjure up horrible scenarios in regards to what may have happened. This is natural in the human condition. Take horror movies for example. The best horror movies don't rely on gore or shock value alone. In fact, the best horror movies show very little in regards to graphic scenery. They rely on tension and fear of the unknown, once again which leaves our imagination to fill in the blanks. With that being said, it is hard to make out what topics of lost media are real or completely fake, especially when it comes to disturbing or graphic content. Which takes us to the topic of the video, gory, gruesome and disturbing pieces of lost media. Number 1. LOL Superman The tragic events of 9-11 etched deep scars upon our collective consciousness, leaving a profound emotional impact that still reverberates through our hearts and souls. In the wake of that fateful day, the world was forever changed, forever scarred by the unimaginable horror that unfolded before our eyes. Grief washed over a nation like an endless tide, engulfing those in a sea of tears and anguish. The sheer magnitude of the loss was unfathomable, as we mourned the thousands of innocent lives that were abruptly extinguished. Families were shattered, their foundations completely destroyed in an instant, leaving behind a void that could never be filled. The pain of separation, the ache of longing and the weight of sorrow became constants in the lives of those left behind. Although I was only 7 years old when the incident happened, the news reports of the planes hitting the towers are etched into my mind. I remember exactly the moment my dad told me what happened on the journey back from school. That day, the world was exposed to traumatic media that detailed loss and destruction on a mass scale. Though the footage that is publicly available ultimately is only the tip of the iceberg, with thousands of hours of footage redacted and locked away with the authorities. Not only have we not seen a huge amount of imagery and videos from that fateful day, but certain content from 9-11 has also been memory hold, such as the reports of vans containing bombs being found on 9-11, as well as the dancing furniture movers who worked for a mysterious company by the name of Urban Moving Systems. I know some of you listening to this will be aware of what I'm referring to, though due to the mainstream nature of social media, I will leave you to do your own research. 
One of the topics of contention in regards to 9-11 lost media would be the jumpers. The mere mention of the 9-11 jumpers sends a wave of profound sadness crashing over me. It takes us back to that fateful day when the world watched in horror as innocent souls faced an unimaginable choice. The desperation, the fear, and the sheer heartbreak etched on their faces as they stood on the precipice of life and death are forever etched in our collective memory. In those unimaginable moments, they made an agonizing decision, one that no human being should ever have to make. Driven by an instinct for survival, they chose to leap into the unknown, defying the laws of gravity in a desperate bid to escape the intense inferno raging behind them. Their bodies, suspended in midair, embodied a haunting blend of vulnerability and strength, a tragic symbol of the depths of human suffering. Each jumper served as a visceral reminder of the unimaginable terror that unfolded that day. Their silent screams echoed across the world, piercing our hearts and reminding us of the indescribable pain that unfolded in the hearts of one of the greatest cities on earth. They became the embodiment of the unthinkable choices that had to be made when faced with a reality that defied comprehension. Videos of the 9-11 jumpers do of course exist online, however, some videos on the more graphic side have said to have been removed from the internet over the years. The most graphic 9-11 jumper video available online, albeit somewhat hard to find, would be a video recorded by Guy Rosbrook, which was taken from the Millennium Hotel, which was opposite the Twin Towers. Guy started filming just after the first plane struck, and the video itself is around 25 minutes long and details the tragic events of that day. In one scene, you see a jumper plummet all the way down, hitting a stage that was below the Twin Towers. As the body hits the stage, you hear a loud echoing thud. Speculation indicates, however, that other videos exist, or at least used to exist online, which depicts jumpers hitting the ground from a much closer perspective. The main video relating to this is commonly referred to as Laugh Out Loud Superman or LOL Superman. Allegedly, the video first surfaced online in the mid 2000s, around 2005 to 2006, with some suggesting that the video was originally shared on the then embryonic video sharing site YouTube. The video in question reportedly captured footage of jumpers impacting the ground at high speeds, as well as showing the aftermath of said collisions. It is speculated that the video is no longer than two minutes at most, and is comprised of shaky cam footage. The exact time of the video itself is unknown, but it is absolutely certain to have taken place somewhere between the first impact in the North Tower and the collapse of the South Tower. It is unknown as to who actually recorded the footage, but video captured from a WABC TV cameraman nearby captures two individuals making their way up a flight of stairs towards the World Trade Center Plaza, and by discerning their likely path after ascending the stairs, their path seems to match with a now debunked single frame that was originally purported to be from the video, making these two unidentified people possible recorders of the LOL Superman video. As for the video itself, it is believed that the video begins as the two cameramen are making their way up the stairs towards the plaza, and then quickly turn to running to one of the sides of a north tower. It is then alleged that graphic footage of a single body or bodies 
falling onto the pavement, as well as close-up shots of corpses that have landed are shown, before the cameramen then make their way out of the plaza. In recent years, the LOL Superman video has arguably become one of the most sought-after clips in disturbing lost media, and naturally, this has led to confusion and false leads. The main false lead being the discovery of the so-called thumbnail from the LOL Superman video. The supposed thumbnail shows a picture of the World Trade Center Plaza supposedly taken that day. The screenshot placed the purported location of the beginning of the video just outside the plaza. The thumbnail itself was discovered by a Reddit user under the name The Original Reddit Poster from a Pinterest account belonging to a man named Kev, who appears to be an avid World Trade Center enthusiast. Although lacking direct evidence that the screenshot was actually from the video, it arguably became a cornerstone of the search for the clip itself, and much of the speculation and searching for the video was based entirely on the screenshot itself. On the 24th of January 2023, Reddit user GToons Animation discovered the original video that contains the screenshot. The video in question contains footage taken from a Chinese tourist's visit to the World Trade Center on June the 10th, 2001. At approximately 1 minute and 35 seconds into the video, the screenshot is shown. As the date this video was taken completely predates 9-11, the original image associated with the LOL Superman video became debunked. Although the debunking of the thumbnail was a huge blow in regards to the search for the video, as well as its existence in the first place, this still hasn't deterred many in continuing the search, with many testimonies from various internet users swearing that they had seen the video. Interestingly, the FBI have confirmed that they do have footage taken from the plaza on 9-11, going as far as not ruling out that they may have footage that matches the description of LOL Superman. On October 22nd, 2022, Redditor Executor Max posted their findings in regards to contacting the 9-11 Museum in New York, inquiring about them possibly possessing the video. In the email message received, the memorial does not deny that they possess footage that may be LOL Superman, but they state that they do not have a right to share or license the footage that you're looking to obtain. Whilst this does not prove that the museum might have possession of the footage, if they did, the likelihood of them releasing the footage is next to impossible. On November the 26th, 2022, a Redditor by the name of CoolBig1520 was alleged to have sent a Freedom of Information Act request to the FBI in order to obtain the video, but that they had declined to share any footage due to it being used as evidence in an ongoing criminal case, seemingly confirming that the FBI does indeed hold some unseen footage that may potentially be or contain the LOL Superman video in question. As of today, no footage of LOL Superman is known to exist, or whether the video was even real in the first place. If a video does exist, it's more than likely in the FBI archives as part of their criminal investigations. It makes it extremely unlikely that anything resembling the footage will be shown anytime soon. Interest in the LOL Superman video is at an all-time peak right now, and for those who are interested in engaging with the search, please dive down the rabbit hole. But more importantly, if you have any information surrounding the video, let us know in the comments, and also the various Reddit threads dedicated to the topic. I'd like to thank the Reddit users previously mentioned, as well as all those who are partaking 
in the search for the video. Ultimately, this topic definitely needs more eyes on it. Number 2. The Jeremy Kyle Show and the death of Steve Diamond. The Jeremy Kyle Show was a British daytime talk show hosted by broadcaster, journalist and writer Jeremy Kyle from 2005 to 2019. It was another show that spawned in the tacky reality TV era, and the show followed a similar format to the Jerry Springer show. It typically involved Jeremy Kyle and guests attempting to resolve significant personal issues, including paternal DNA tests, cheating accusations, and addiction, among other issues. Even before the show's cancellation, the Jeremy Kyle show already had a controversial history, facing criticism for exploiting vulnerable members of the British public, all for the purpose of entertainment. In 2007, a judge who proceeded over a case where one of the show's guests headbutted another in front of the cameras, described it as human bear baiting, with similar criticisms coming from the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy, who called for an ITV review on how the show treated its guests. For me personally, I remember the Jeremy Kyle show being a staple of British daytime TV, and even as a kid, I felt repulsed by the nature of the show and its slimy host, Jeremy Kyle. The show's biggest controversy came in May of 2019, when guest Steve Diamond committed the arsonist days after he failed a lie detector test on the show, with Kyle reportedly branding Steve Diamond as a serial liar and a failure, among other comments. Following this, ITV decided to cancel the show on the 15th of May 2019 after conducting an internal investigation into the show's conduct. A week before his death, 63-year-old Steve Diamond appeared on the show, and he and then fiance Jane Callaghan requested a lie detector test following accusations of cheating. According to an audience member who was in attendance for the segment, initially, nothing was out of the ordinary, with Jeremy Kyle asking the audience whether they believed Diamond had passed the testing, and the majority agreed that he had. However, upon Jeremy Kyle revealing that Steve Diamond had failed the test, the audience saw him collapse to the ground, with both he and Callaghan being devastated by the results. Despite the uncomfortable atmosphere caused by the reaction to the test, Jeremy Kyle became extremely critical towards the guest, branding him a serial liar, stating that he would not trust him with a chocolate button, and even asking the audience, has anyone got a shovel? According to Diamond's brother Leslie, Jeremy Kyle was in Steve's face, following him even after he had left the stage, and labelled him a failure. Following the filming of the episode, Steve Diamond and Jane Callaghan split up, with Steve becoming very despondent following his ordeal on the show. On the 9th of May 2019, Hampshire police discovered his body. A coroner report indicated that Steve Diamond had committed suicide via a morphine overdose that contributed towards left ventricular hypertrophy. On the 15th of May 2019, ITV announced the immediate cancellation of the show, and ITV would go as far as wiping all traces from the show from their website, as well as social media channels. They just moved on, washing their hands, despite the damage that they had caused. In November of 2020, the official coroner's ruling, which was made by Jason Pegg in July of that same year, deemed that Kyle's comments and overall behaviour during the filming may have caused or contributed to Steve Diamond's death, and deeming him to be an interesting person in the case. 
it was also revealed that Stephen Diamond was unable to appear on the show previously, having lived with depression and being prescribed antidepressant medication, with Jeremy Kyle and his crew being aware of these facts. Additionally, a digital culture, media and sport committee investigating reality television accused ITV of complete corporate failure of responsibility over the show, believing it was exploitative and failed to provide adequate aftercare following analysis of unaired footage. The episode featuring Stephen Diamond was not broadcast prior to his death, with ITV confirming that the episode would not air. Footage still exists, with it being viewed by Peg as part of the coroner's ruling. However, with the episode remaining part of a current investigation, the fact that ITV has removed most traces of a show from its domain, and out of respect for Diamond and his relatives, it is extremely unlikely that the episode will ever be available for public viewing. The unaired episode and the death of Steve also shed light on the inaccuracy of lie detector tests and the unethical nature of them being used on the show, with some stating that the lie detector tests used on the Jeremy Kyle show were only accurate at 70%. Steve Diamond was adamant that he never cheated on Jane, and stated as much in his final message before his death where he stated, I hope the Jeremy Kyle show is so happy now. They are responsible for what happens. I hope this makes good ratings for them. I bet they keep this quiet. Never, never, never did I cheat on you. Never, never. My final words. Thankfully, the episode has never seen the light of day, which, of course, was the last known footage of Steve before his tragic death. Number 3. The Crossbow Cannibal In May of 2010, the UK was rocked by the arrest of Stephen Griffiths and his heinous crimes. He was responsible for the gruesome Bradford murders, which were the serial killings of three women in the city of Bradford, West Yorkshire, between 2009 and 2010. The tale of Stephen Griffiths raises the question of whether such evil is born or made, nature versus nurture. The truth is, there were many red flags along the way with Stephen, and if they were taken seriously, then potentially the grisly murders may have been prevented. Stephen Griffiths was born on the 24th of December 1969 as the first child of a frozen food salesman also named Stephen Griffiths and a tally sales operator named Moira D. Worst. His mother Moira was secretly a con artist who would later be convicted of fraud. The couple divorced when Stephen was only 13 years old leaving him and his siblings to stay with their mother, despite her extensive criminal records. Quite frankly, Stephen's relationship with his mother was bizarre to say the least. As a child, Stephen had a strange and disturbing habit of watching his mother have sex with multiple men in their garden. With criminality and degeneracy surrounding Stephen at a young age, it's no wonder that he himself would engage in similar behaviour. As a teenager, Stephen would shoplift, and on one occasion, he slashed a clerk's face with a knife when he attempted to stop him. This attack resulted in him being arrested and sentenced to three years in youth custody, when Stephen was aged 17 years old. During his time in prison, he lost contact with his family, and told probation officers and psychiatrists that he fantasised about being a serial killer. A year after his first arrest, Griffiths was released and began to live in a flat located in Manningham, enrolling in psychology at Bradford College, once again taking a keen interest in serial killers during his studies. 
Despite taking an interest in his college course, Stephen would continue down a path of criminality. In 1989, Stephen Griffiths was sentenced to 100 hours of community service after an air pistol was found in his possession. He had previously used the pistol to shoot birds, which he would later then dissect. Once again, another red flag showcasing a behaviour that is very common among potential future serial killers. The next year, he was arrested again and sentenced to two years in prison for holding a knife to a young girl's throat. Sometime after his release, Stephen began collecting many books about serial killers in order to study them in a more efficient manner. Stephen mainly focused on Jack the Ripper, the Moors murderers, the Acid Bath murderer, and his personal favourite, Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. In 1998, Stephen Griffiths began dating a woman for two years, but the relationship ended after he invited her to his flat, and she found every single surface covered in plastic. Later, Stephen dated another woman, but she broke up with him because of his abusive and controlling nature. This resulted in Stephen stalking her and harassing her for years, despite knowing that she would be the mother of his child that was unfortunately lost in a miscarriage, potentially due to the stress and fear that he was enforcing upon her. In 2001, Stephen began to drink heavily and take various drugs. He also brought two lizards and frequently took them out for walks on dog leads. One of his neighbours, Rachel Farrington, was invited to his flat and saw Stephen feeding live rats to his lizards. Another former friend, Billy Parkin, stated that he once saw Stephen eating a live baby rat. In 2003, Stephen Griffiths earned a bachelor's degree in psychology and enrolled at the University of Bradford for a PhD a year later. Being unemployed, Stephen spent the majority of his time on the internet, downloading violent pornography. He would also frequently quote criminals and serial killers on his social media accounts. He would also occasionally quote fictional killers, such as Francis Dollohyde, a necrophilic serial killer and family annihilator from the Thomas Harris novel, Red Dragon. Griffith's MySpace account username was Ven Pariah, a figure from demonology. Ultimately, Stephen Griffiths was a ticking time bomb that was waiting to explode in a fit of violence. Unable to resist his urges, Stephen Griffiths decided to begin serial killing, killing prostitutes in the Bradford area as a way to honour Peter Sutcliffe, who had killed some of his victims in that same location. On the 22nd of June 2009, Stephen took a prostitute named Susan Rushworth to his flat and killed her before dismembering her in his bathtub. His next two victims were killed in the next year. Suzanne Blamirez, Griffith's third and final victim, attempted to escape, but was fatally shot with one of his crossbows and then stabbed. A CCTV camera, which had been installed in the hallway for the sole purpose of monitoring Stephen Griffiths, captured the whole event and resulted in his arrest. Just an hour after killing Suzanne, Stephen searched for a fourth victim. He nearly found one in 28-year-old Rosalind Edmondson, who was on her way to collect methadone from an all-night chemist not far from his flat. He complimented her and invited her back into his apartment. Initially, she walked back with him, with CCTV footage capturing the two outside the block of flats. However, Rosalind had second thoughts, and she decided to walk back to her own apartment. Stephen did not attempt to convince her to change her mind, and he returned home about an hour after the encounter. 
In court, Stephen introduced himself as the Crossbow Cannibal, an alias that would later serve as his official serial killer nickname. He pled guilty to all three murders and is currently serving life in prison. He also has attempted suicide several times while incarcerated. Parts of the CCTV footage of Suzanne's murder were broadcast on television. One broadcast by NBC News shows a video of Griffiths flipping the bird to the camera, as well as trying to convince Edmondson to come inside. But while photos showcasing Suzanne entering the flat and later her running away, as well as an angry Griffiths chasing her, the actual footage of these events were never shown. Additionally, NBC News stated that they would not show the footage of Stephen dragging Suzanne back into his flat, nor would any footage of the crossbow shots be shown. This appears to be the case with other news broadcasts, likely because of the graphic nature of the murder and out of respect for Suzanne and her relatives. The full CCTV tape, while recovered, will never likely be shown to the public. It said that the CCTV footage shows Suzanne being struck in the head with a crossbow bolt as she tries to run away from Griffiths in the apartment corridors. The tape is then said to show Stephen stabbing her to make sure that she was dead, before dragging her by her legs back into his apartment. As well as the CCTV footage of the murder of Suzanne, it's also reported that Stephen recorded the dismemberment of his second victim, Shelley Armitage, as well as taking various photos throughout the dismemberment process. It's also speculated that the footage that he recorded may have also shown scenes of cannibalism. On the 26th of April 2010, 31-year-old Shelley Armitage went missing. A former student at St. Joseph's College in Bradford, Armitage was known for being popular and good-looking, and had aspirations to succeed in a modelling career. However, after she and her best friend began to experiment with drugs, she became addicted, and was ultimately unable to escape a life of drink, drugs and sex work. Concern over Shelley began in late April, after she failed to appear in scheduled court sessions twice, as well as not using her mobile phone or claiming benefits since her disappearance. Like with Rushworth, Armitage ended up in Stephen's flats, where Stephen proceeded to end her life via a crossbow shot to the head, before dismembering and partially eating her. During the process of butchering Shelley, Stephen decided to record the dismemberment on his mobile phone, where he discussed in detail what he was doing. He tied her dead body up in the bath, before spraying her back in black paint with the words, My sex slave. He then says, I am the vampire. I am the bloodbath artist. Here's a model who is assisting me. And he then dismembers her with knives and power tools. At some point following the murder, Stephen ended up losing his mobile phone on a train. It ended up in the possession of a few people who were able to view the footage, and the mobile was even sold twice before eventually it was handed over to the police. According to reports, the mobile phone also contained footage of Stephen's other murders too, with a senior detective describing it as the most disturbing thing that he had ever seen. As for the photos and dismemberment footage, nothing has ever been publicly released. The mobile phone containing the media remains with the British court system. Considering the extremely graphic and disturbing nature of the videos, plus out of respect for the victims and their relatives, it means that there is an extremely low chance of its media ever leaking to the public. In fact, it may have even been destroyed by this point in time. But anyway, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it, if you can enjoy this sort of content. As always, thank you guys so much for the recent support. It really goes a long way 
in regards to helping the channel out. So big up to you guys as always for being super encouraging, super supportive. It really does mean a lot. So thank you guys very much. If anybody wants to get in touch, please feel free to follow me on Twitter. You can drop me a DM and, you know, uh, suggest various topics that I could cover, things of that nature. And also, if you could do me a massive, massive favour, if you could also follow me on Twitch, that would be much appreciated. Once again, the link will be in the pinned comments. But anyway, as always, stay safe. And I'll catch you on the next one.